Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for this virtual U Miami Health Talk, the latest on AFib, what every patient needs to know on this rainy South Florida evening. There are hundreds of you uh, in with us tonight in this uh, webinar and many more who will join us, so showing how prevalent this is. I'm health journalist Ileana Bravo, your moderator for this evening's webinar presented by U Health's Cardiac and Vascular Program. U Health has a multidisciplinary team of experts who focus on advanced and novel treatments for atrial fibrillation. Our physicians and researchers are actively engaged in creating new methods and approaches to treat heart arrhythmias. And U Health has one of the only comprehensive programs in Florida for atrial fibrillation risk factor management. Our Center for AFib is a leader in research related to diagnosis and treatment with funding from the National Institutes of Health and other private and industry sources. We invite you to learn more about U Health's cardiovascular department by visiting umiamihealth.org slash cardiovascular. To schedule a consultation and screening, please call 305-243-5554. We are going to repeat that information again so you can take a picture of your screen, so don't worry, we will give it to you again. Well, tonight, our panel of experts will discuss the latest on AFib treatments and how to manage risk factors, specifically living with atrial fibrillation, how to prevent strokes associated with AFib, who's better suited for medications, and who should consider catheter ablation. If I don't feel the atrial fibrillation, should I still be concerned? And at the end of the presentation, we're going to host a Q&A session. Now, this is a unique opportunity for you to ask direct questions of our experts, so don't miss out. All you have to do is use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to enter your questions, and we'll prepare them for our panel. So now it's time to introduce our first speaker, Jeffrey Goldberger, the director of the Center for Atrial Fibrillation at the University of Miami Health System and an esteemed professor of medicine at the Miller School of Medicine. He's a leading authority in cardiac arrhythmias and autonomic nervous system effects on cardiac electrophysiology. Dr. Goldberger has led numerous clinical trials and his research has focused on innovative diagnostic and treatment approaches for patients with arrhythmias, particularly atrial fibrillation and prevention of sudden cardiac death. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Goldberger to our screen tonight. Welcome Dr. Goldberger, make sure you unmute. Thank you, uh, Ileana. And uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining us uh, for this webinar. Uh, so my task is uh, to go over with you everything I know about atrial fibrillation in the next 15 minutes. Um, it's a tough task, but I think we'll we'll get through it um, with the, the goals that are listed here. We'll first go over what is atrial fibrillation, who gets atrial fibrillation, what kind of a problem this is, how we're doing in terms of our treatments generally for all of cardiology, and then some newer approaches. So let's talk about what is atrial fibrillation. Many of you know this already, but uh, some of you do not, so we need to catch you up. Uh, everybody knows the heart is a pump. It has four chambers. The upper chambers are called the atria. And this is the right side, the right atrium. This is the left atrium. And then the main pumping chambers of the heart are called the ventricles. And again, you have a right ventricle and a left ventricle. And what drives the heart to beat, it's the pump, is its electrical system. Just like any machine that you have at a home, in order for it to operate, it needs uh, electricity. And the same is true for the heart. The normal electrical system in the heart starts up here in a structure called the sinus node, and then the electrical impulses spread across the top chambers, across the atria, and then they coalesce here in the middle, and then they go down into the lower chambers. When you have this normal rhythm, you get an electrical depolarization from the top chambers on the EKG, and that you see down here. So you have this little depolarization here, which is called a P wave. And when it gets down into the ventricle, into the lower chambers, these are much larger chambers. And so you get a much larger signal and that's the QRS. So normal sequence of activation and pumping is the top chambers, the atria pump, and then the lower chambers pump. On the right side over here, you see what happens when, the, our, when there are chaotic signals in the upper chambers. So there's not one location from which the uh, atria are being depolarized. And there are multiple sites here and therefore there's chaotic activation of the ventricles. So you see all of this 
irregular activation of the ventricles, and you don't, you don't see this nice P wave like you saw over here. The only other thing I'd like to point out to you is that most atrial fibrillation does come from the left atrium. And the other structure that's very important here, these are the veins, what we call the pulmonary veins, that come into the atria from the lungs. And you'll see in a few minutes why this is very important. So who gets AFib? So there are a lot of different types of patients who get AFib. So first of all, even patients without heart disease can get AFib. Patients with hypertension can get AFib. Patients with obesity can get AFib. People with valvular heart disease, heart failure, thyroid disease, people with infections like influenza or COVID, people who've had surgery. So you can see that AFib can touch anybody, people without heart disease, people with heart disease, and people with precipitants that are other medical conditions. It turns out that most of the people that get atrial fibrillation, you see here a histogram showing by age, uh, it tends to be a disease that occurs in people in their 70s, but there are a lot of people in their 60s, 50s, and even 40s who get atrial fibrillation. We sometimes even see very young people in their 30s and 20s with atrial fibrillation. But clearly, it gets much, much more common as people get older. All right, so what kind of problem is atrial fibrillation? So it could be a primary electrical problem, so some problem with the electrical system in the heart. It could be an anatomical problem, so there could be areas that have fibrosis. It could be a nervous system problem. The autonomic nervous system interacts very uh, intricately with the heart, and this could certainly precipitate atrial fibrillation. It could be a cellular problem. There could be problems with the cells inside the atria that lead to this. It could be a hormonal problem. It could be a genetic problem or other things that we don't know. And this is the challenge of atrial fibrillation, is trying to understand what kind of a problem it is. Uh, this is from a review article that we published this year, and it sort of breaks down what kind of problem atrial fibrillation is. We have a list here of causative factors. So some of the things that we talked about, obesity, but diabetes, sedentary lifestyle, alcohol, heart failure, uh, lung disease, chronic inflammatory conditions, all these things are causative factors that may lead to atrial fibrillation. But how do they lead to atrial fibrillation? Well, they have to lead to atrial fibrillation through these mechanistic mediators. And these are things, we're not gonna go into detail, but that affect gene expression, that affect uh, the adipose tissue, the fat tissue around the heart, hormones, hemodynamic factors, how the heart pumps. And then ultimately, these me mechanistic mediators can lead to fibrosis, neural remodeling, atrial stretch, affecting the cells, the ion channels in the cells that lead to basically a diseased atrium that then leads to atrial fibrillation. So I want you to think about the atrial fibrillation as having two steps here, the causative factors that if we could control some of those, we can prevent atrial fibrillation. And also here, the target therapeutics, if we can identify these mechanistic mediators and come up with targeted therapeutics, we don't have to actually even get to atrial fibrillation. Now, I'm not going to talk about all of the different therapies that we have for atrial fibrillation, except to say that there are many therapies that are available, and we have to individualize whether we are going to observe patients, whether we're going to treat with risk factor modification, medications, catheter ablation, surgical ablation, or other approaches. And you'll hear more about stroke prevention from Dr. Mitrani. So what is catheter ablation for atrial fibrillation? What you see here is a picture of the back of the heart, the back of the left atrium, and you see the uh, left atrium, and then you see the pulmonary veins which enter into the left atrium. So this is a what we call a voltage map, and it shows where there are active cells in the atria. And you can see that the atria have cells not only in the atrium itself, but you can see that atrial act the electrical activity extends into the pulmonary veins. It turns out that the pulmonary veins are a very important trigger for atrial fibrillation. And we target these for ablation. And you can see here, after ablation, there's now no atrial activity in the veins. And that's what we typically call a pulmonary vein isolation procedure. And that's the main part of any ablation procedure for atrial fibrillation. So how are we doing in terms of our therapy? So antiarrhythmic drugs, 
generally are 30 to 60% effective. Catheter ablation for a kind of atrial fibrillation called paroxysmal is 70 to 80% effective. Persistent atrial fibrillation is only 50 to 60% effective. And our ability to predict who's at risk for stroke is only 60%. Now, when I was in high school, if we scored between a 70 and 80%, that was about a C. If you scored anywhere in these ranges, you got a D to F. So that's really the state of our therapies right now is we're a bit between a C and an F in terms of what we're able to offer you. And what our goal is to get to the A and B area. And I'm gonna show you some exciting data that actually shows that we are trying, we are getting there. Now, when it comes to treatment for atrial fibrillation, the question is, is it one size fits all? Can you use the same treatment for all patients with atrial fibrillation? And the answer is obviously no. Um, although for the most part, our current approaches are really one size fits all. And we try to we try to use the same paradigm for treatment for all patients. But I think what's gonna happen is we're going to find some new ways to look at different individualized approaches, whether it's affecting lifestyle, the autonomics, the structure of the heart, genetics, comorbidities. These are all uh, other ways that we have to look at atrial fibrillation and try to individualize therapy. So one approach that's been very, very effective in our hands and in others is looking at risk factor modification. And there are a lot of different risk factors for atrial fibrillation, as we mentioned, weight, uh, high cholesterol, sleep apnea, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, alcohol. And if we can control those in a, a, in a uh, rigorous fashion, we can actually improve our outcomes for treatment. This is a study that was done in Australia. And what they did is they basically compared uh, a physician-led weight loss program to a control group, which was self-directed. So the physicians just told the patients, listen, you're overweight, you need to go lose weight, goodbye and good luck, and come back later. And what you'll see here, this is now looking at, we'll just look at BMI, which is uh, body mass index, which is just like weight. If you have a physician-led program to do this, you have actually a much greater weight loss than if you just tell the patient, go lose weight and come back. And that's not too surprising. But what's really fascinating about this, they looked at the symptom severity score for the atrial fibrillation and the symptom burden score. And you can see here that the intervention group, those who lost the weight, had much better symptom control. Now, we've extended these findings um, into a study called the LEAF study, which is liraglutide effects on atrial fibrillation. So liraglutide is a medication uh, like Wegovi or Zempic, which many of you are familiar with. So it's a GLP-1 agonist. And what we did is we used liraglutide as adjunctive therapy to risk factor modification to try to see if that would improve the outcomes from catheter ablation. And this is, I think, the most exciting slide I have to show you. Um, so this is now looking at freedom from atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter after catheter ablation. And what you see here in the red are the patients who got risk factor modification plus liraglutide, and in the blue, patients who got only risk factor modification. At the end of the year, freedom from atrial fibrillation here was 87% and was only 53% here. So 87%, we're now approaching a B plus, maybe even an A minus in terms of our treatment. And that's a huge C change from what we've been able to offer people in the past. To hammer home this uh, message, here's a 60-year-old gentleman with hypertension, coronary artery disease, high cholesterol. He came to see me with atrial fibrillation. He had to have a cardioversion. He had atrial fibrillation that recurred, and then he enrolled in the LEAF trial, and he was actually randomized to risk factor modification and liraglutide. And after three months of treatment, he was supposed to have his ablation. But after three months of treatment, he said to me, listen, I'm not having atrial fibrillation anymore. Do I still need to have an ablation? And you can see here, with the, he had a tremendous degree of weight loss, 96 kilograms to about 87 kilograms in three months. And his atrial fibrillation disappeared and has been gone for the following two years. So 
Our current paradigm for treatment of atrial fibrillation is to make a diagnosis. We do these diagnostic tests, an EKG, an echocardiogram, blood testing for thyroid function. And it's sort of embarrassing, but this testing is the same testing that we did for atrial fibrillation when I was a medical student many decades ago. And if you think about diagnostics that have been developed for cancer, which are tremendous, we have really not done any, made any progress in terms of our diagnostics. We have our treatments and we have our post-care monitoring and anticoagulation. I think our paradigm for atrial fibrillation is going to have to change. The first thing is we're going to have to do prevention. Diagnosis is going to be the same, but we're going to have to do then for patients who have atrial fibrillation, much more advanced phenotyping. This is basically looking at biomarkers and other things that will help us guide treatment and pick treatments that are more appropriate to the individual type of atrial fibrillation. And there will also then have to individualize our post-care um, approaches. Now, some of the things I may have told you may have seemed depressing. This next slide is a little complicated, but I hope it, but I hope it'll bring hope to the whole scenario. Remember, we talked about the target, the causative factors and targeting them and the mechanistic mediators. So in the green up here, you see the causative factors. And in the blue are treatments that are available. So we have treatments that we can use to target these causative factors and try to prevent atrial fibrillation. For the mechanistic mediators, again, you see these in orange. And in blue, again, a variety of treatments that are either being developed or in testing that can affect these mechanistic mediators. So I think the future is very bright for ability to, uh, to treat atrial fibrillation and score an A uh, in terms of our treatment approaches. So our challenges for the future are really personalized approaches for atrial fibrillation. And that's something that we've already in implementing in our Center for Atrial Fibrillation, trying to figure out what kind of atrial fibrillation a patient has, what we call phenotyping, implementing our risk factor modification with or without the GLP-1 agonists, the semaglutide, uh, Wegovy type medications, improved ablation approaches, which we're developing, and then better prediction of stroke. And then most importantly, and the frontier is actually prevention of atrial fibrillation. Of course, this can only be done with a team of people. And we have a fantastic team of people in our Center for Atrial Fibrillation. And I encourage you to seek, it, seek us out and uh, we'd be happy to help you out if you have atrial fibrillation or if you have a friend or relative who has atrial fibrillation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldberger. And I think we had some breaking news there with you talking about the LEAF study and the GLP-1 drugs. I'm certain there's going to be a lot of interest in that alone. So we'll get hopefully to that in the Q&A session. But right now, let's welcome our next speaker, Dr. Raul Mitrani, the Director of Cardiac Electrophysiology at the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine. He specializes in diagnosing and treating simple and complex cardiac arrhythmias with a focus in atrial fibrillation and flutter. With over 30 years of experience, Dr. Mitrani is an expert in performing cardiac ablations and managing advanced cardiac devices like pacemakers and defibrillators. In addition to his clinical work, Dr. Mitrani has led groundbreaking research on improving treatments for heart rhythm issues and has contributed to numerous clinical trials. He's also been involved in many studies, including the relationship of atrial fibrillation to stroke risk. So Dr. Matrani, if you're ready, you can get your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. You can hear me, everyone? Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for spending an hour with us. This is a great opportunity to interact with you. Thank you, Liana. Thank you to the staff of uh, Miami Health Talks, you Miami Health Talks. And thank you, Dr. Goldberger, for a great introduction to atrial fibrillation. My task is uh, a little bit more circumscribed. We'll talk about three points. One is living with atrial fibrillation, how to prevent strokes associated with AFib. AFib is short for atrial fibrillation because strokes are truly one of the devastating consequences that can occur from AFib. Then we'll talk about who's better suited for medications and who should consider catheter ablation. And then we'll talk about a common question I get from patients is, if I don't feel the atrial fibrillation, should I still be concerned? So atrial fibrillation and stroke. In this country, there are about 800,000 strokes per year. 
uh, strokes, uh, cerebrovascular disease is one of the leading causes of death and certainly one of the leading causes of disability among, among patients. And what we know is that patients with atrial fibrillation are at greater risk for stroke. For instance, atrial fibrillation has a five times higher risk for having a stroke compared to patients who don't have atrial fibrillation. So most patients, and we'll talk about that in a second, would benefit from strategies to try to prevent stroke. So these are the drugs that can reduce strokes from atrial fibrillation. One is uh, warfarin or Coumadin. Some of you, like me, who grew up in the 20th century may remember that drug. It actually was developed as a rat poison in the 1950s, and then it, they found out it made an excellent anticoagulant. And um, one of the advantages is because it's an older drug, it's, it's uh, very inexpensive. However, it does require frequent and routine blood tests to check the level, and it interacts with food and medications. And just so everyone is clear, warfarin is the only drug, the only anticoagulant drug for patients with metallic heart valves. There are newer anticoagulant drugs that came onto the market over the last 10 to 15 years. There are Pixaban or Eliquis, as you may know it, the Bigotran or Pradaxa, as you may know it. The Bigotran is now generic, the Doxaban or Lixiana, and the Rivaroxaban and Zeralto. In general, these newer drugs are recommended over warfarin in most, but not all, patients. So one question I get is, I'm on aspirin or Plavix. Are these drugs, and Plavix is clopidogrel, are these drugs good enough to prevent strokes if I have atrial fibrillation? The evidence and the overwhelming evidence suggests that drugs that inhibit platelets, and that's what aspirin does and what Plavix does, they do not lower the stroke risk. Even if patients need to take aspirin or Plavix or other similar drugs, because say you had a stent, right? You'll say, oh, I had a stent a few months ago. I'm on Plavix and aspirin. You know, you, and you have AFib, I would say you still need to be on anticoagulant therapy. Then do all patients with AFib need blood thinners or anticoagulants? And the answer is that most but not all patients with atrial fibrillation need anticoagulants. And that has to do with the data that Dr. Goldberger just showed you. He showed you all these risk factors, high blood pressure, uh, coronary disease, valvular heart disease. And these risk factors contribute to the risk of stroke in context of having atrial fibrillation. Specifically, we use a risk score system, which includes history of diabetes, hypertension, heart or vascular artery disease, or heart failure, or age greater than 65, and they're all one point. Age greater than 75 is two points, and prior history of stroke or mini stroke is also two points. Generally speaking, anticoagulants are recommended when the risk score is two or greater. And you can see amongst the elderly population, these are very common conditions. Anticoag anticoagulants can be considered if the risk score is one. However, importantly, we have a shared decision-making discussion with the patient, and we need to balance the risk of bleeding, which varies according to the patient. So this is a joint decision we make with the, point, with the patient, but we generally do recommend anticoagulants when the risk, risk score is two or greater. What if I have a fib and can't take a blood thinner since I have bleeding problems? Again, a very common issue. So, there was a trial that compared the anticoagulant drugs to a procedure, and in this trial, it was the Watchman procedure. If you see in my slide here in this small area, this is part of the left atrium, and there's this thing that sticks out, and this thing is called the left atrial appendage. That's where blood clots form when patients are in atrial fibrillation. So the Watchman device is actually like an umbrella-like device, which is folded into the catheter. And this is not open heart surgery, it goes through the groin. And we insert that Watchman device to plug up that appendage and that blocks blood clots from going into the brain. So the study showed, if you look at the lower left graph, that if you compare 
the Watchman device, which is left atrial appendage occlusion, LAAC, to a DOAC, which is direct oral anticoagulant or the newer drugs, Watchman device actually looked a little bit better in terms of reducing the primary endpoint of stroke, many stroke, blood clots anywhere, cardiovascular death, ble bleeding or other heart complications. From a statistical standpoint, it was deemed non-inferior. So I'm not gonna say it's better, I'm just gonna say it's non-inferior because that's, that's the honest truth. If you look at just the endpoint of stroke or mini stroke, comparing it to the lines are superimposable. So that's great. That means the Watchman device is as good as these blood thinners. But if you look at any bleeding not related to the procedure to put the Watchman, but after the procedure, we see the Watchman device is clearly better than being on anticoagulants, which makes perfect sense. If you're on a blood thinner, you're gonna have more bleeding. So in general, we don't recommend the, this Watchman device or the left atrial appendage closure device in everyone. It's another shared decision-making. We look at why you can't or why you prefer not to take a blood thinner, and then we make a joint decision. So what is ablation? So ablation basically is delivering energy to desiccate or cauterize cardiac tissue. Initially, as Dr. Um, Goldberger discussed before, the area or the border zone between the pulmonary vein shown here and the left atrium shown here is where AFib starts. It's like the trigger point for AFib. If AFib is like a fire, th these trigger points are like the sparks that start the fire. So the premise is if you eliminate the sparks, you won't have the fire or you won't have the atrial fibrillation. So radio frequency ablation, which was the first technique, heated up the tissue and cauterized the tissue around the pulmonary veins to prevent these sparks from starting atrial fibrillation. Later on, they developed a technique called cryo balloon, where they would freeze the tissue around the pulmonary veins. So you see, this could be like a one-shot deal, and this is like connect the dots, make the cautery all around the vein so these sparks can't start atrial fibrillation. The, these two techniques are called thermal ablation. Thermal because radio frequency heats tissue and the cryo cools tissue. And one of the problems with thermal ablation is that the heat or the coolness can transmit to tissue next to the heart. So there's a potential for damaging the phrenic nerve. There's a potential for damaging the esophagus. The reality is the risks are low because we're aware of this potential and we take precautions to avoid this collateral damage. Pulse field ablation is a new energy source which we use at UHealth. It was approved by the FDA earlier this year. And instead of heating or cooling the tissue, it kind of shocks the tissue. And by shocking the tissue, it generally does not have any collateral damage. So in that sense, it would appear to be safer, but the reality is with the radio frequency or cryo balloon, we always took steps to make it as safe as possible as well. At this point, pulse field ablation is a newer technology. It's at least as effective as the radio frequency and the cryo balloon, and it's at least as safe as these two other techniques, but it makes for a more efficient procedure. So that's why we're using it very often for patients with atrial fibrillation at University of Miami Health System. So this is what a pulse field catheter can look like. There's all these electrodes. This, you're looking inside the atrium, looking at the vein, and by positioning this catheter at the orifice of the vein, we develop the shock energy, and we uh, are able to uh, achieve the ablation. What it does is the shock disrupts the integrity of the cells. This is like a cell of the heart, and by shocking the in integrity, by disrupting the integrity, you're able to achieve the ablation results. So ablation versus medications for AFib, which is better? So ablation is better for patients who have symptoms during bouts of AFib, if medications were tried and didn't work. If the heart muscle is getting weak, studies show that with ablation, heart function recovery is more likely. It's generally better for younger and more active patients. And let me tell you, I have a lot of young and active 80 year old patients. So it's not an age thing, it's really young and active. 
if the heart rate is too fast and or too slow during or after bouts of atrial fibrillation. Medications may be better for patients who have chronic AFib. They've been in AFib for years and years and years. It doesn't bother them. Ablation is unlikely to make much of a difference in that situation. And so if they have lack of symptoms due to AFib, if heart rate is under control with the AFib, patients who are older, more sedentary lifestyle, or ablation doesn't work for everyone, as Dr. Goldberger pointed out. So if you've already tried ablation, especially multiple times and it didn't work, medications is going to be better. And this is just one representative study comparing ablation to drug therapy. And what we see here is freedom from AFib. So everyone starts off at 100%, okay? They, patients get medicines or ablation, they're at 100% free from AFib, and then the clock starts. And we see the curve for antiarrhythmic drug therapy. A lot of patients are no longer free from antiarrhythmic drugs. And at one year, about 30, 35% of patients are free from AFib, and 65, 70% of patients had at least one recurrence of AFib. Ablation is far from perfect, as Dr. Goldberger pointed out. But here in this study, it was at least 60 to 70% effective. And like what Dr. Goldberg had pointed out, if you start combining ablation with risk factor management, losing weight, et cetera, we can get that success rate even higher. So some patients say, okay, so what if I don't have AFib? I mean, will I live longer? If I'm in normal rhythm, will I prevent a stroke? And there was a study, there are multiple studies actually look at heart endpoints. And this was from the Cabana trial, which compared drug versus ablation therapy. And we see an event rate looking not whether they had AFib or not, but whether we prevented death, disabling stroke, serious bleeding, or cardiac arrest. And based on patients who actually received ablation versus patients who actually received drug, we see that ablation was better. Fewer patients, the event rate was lower, who had ablation compared with drugs. So this means that with ablation, it's superior to drugs, at least with this analysis, compared to drug therapy. Not all studies have shown this, and we really have to get into the details of studies, which we don't have time to do today, but it's something we can discuss with you as individuals if it's something you're willing to or wish to explore with us in the future. So this is an example of what we look at uh, for when we do an ablation. We, in the left, we actually create an electroanatomic image of your left atrium, and you can see the vein sticking out. This is intracardiac echo, where we can see our catheter as it touches the uh, cardiac tissue by the veins, and we also use x-ray. So we use multiple imaging techniques to make this as safe and effective as possible. So the last topic is, I don't feel my AFib. Should I still be concerned? The answer is yes. And this was a study that showed that strokes can be the first manifestation of atrial fibrillation. So in this study, they see that some patients uh, had their stroke when they had their AFib or they had their stroke and then had AFib. Presumably, they were having asymptomatic AFib prior to the stroke. So, as a very minimum, as a very minimum, patients should be on anticoagulation therapy if they're asymptomatic and they're candidates for anticoagulation therapy. The other reason it matters, even if you're asymptomatic with atrial fibrillation is that there's an association with mortality. Now, association doesn't prove causality. And this is an older study, and our treatments have definitely improved over the last 25 years since this was published. But men and women with AFib here in yellow and green had a higher mortality compared to men and women without AFib, both in the younger cohort and in the older patient population. Again, it doesn't necessarily mean that AFib caused the mortality, Remember, Dr. Goldberger pointed out that a lot of conditions like heart failure can cause AFib, and heart failure can also impact mortality. But it raises the question that some patients will do better in normal rhythm. So 
at the very minimum, if you don't feel your AFib and you have risk factors to stroke, you should be on a blood thinner. If your heart rate is too fast with the AFib, you may need medications to slow it down. And drugs to help restore normal rhythm and or ablation can be considered to restore normal rhythm because it may improve your quality of life and decrease the likelihood of other problems in the future. However, there are many patients who live just fine with atrial fibrillation. So the treatment has to be individualized, which is a point Dr. Goldberger make and we all make here at UHealth. So in conclusion, atrial fibrillation is a common, a common heart rhythm problem that can lead to strokes and heart failure, can cause symptoms in many patients. It's a consideration for strategies to prevent strokes should be considered and discussed in all patients with AFib. Not everyone needs it, but the majority of patients will need some type of strategy to prevent strokes. For many, but not all patients, treatment with ablation and or medication should be personalized, considering other concurrent medical problems and patient preference. Risk factor management, as discussed by Dr. Goldberger, is an important component of treatment. And even patients with asymptomatic AFib need evaluation and potential treatment. So Ileana, I wanna thank you for giving me the time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mitrani. That, that was wonderful, great overview, gives people a lot to, to consider. And we'll get you back on screen now, Dr. Goldberger, because it's time to launch our Q&A session. And there are a lot of people who uh, have been asking questions. And, and I'm going to start with, with one that I don't want there to be a misunderstanding of what was said on the GLP-1 drugs, the Wegovi, et cetera. Dr. Goldberger, can you clarify that the patients for that uh, medication therapy uh, are because they have these risk factors of obesity and, and other things, or everyone with AFib is going to say, now I should go on Wegovi. So please clarify. Yes, thank you, Liana. Uh, so I, let me also clarify that these data are, are not yet published. Uh, so everybody here really got, as, uh, as you said, uh, late breaking news. Uh, we hope that they will be published in the next few months. Um, so the design of the study was to enroll patients who have clinical indications for the use of, of the raglatide or Wegovi. And so it is patients with obesity and a cardiac risk factor. So the de definition for obesity for, uh, for the FDA for the use of this drug is a body mass index of over 27 kilograms per meter squared. So, and the atrial fibrillation by itself is a cardiac risk factor. So it's people with that constellation of findings, both AFib and obesity. And then it's appropriate for them to be treated for this. Now you ask a more, more substantive question, and I, I think there have been some other questions on the chat. When you look at the effects of the GLP-1 agonists on atrial fibrillation, is the effect mediated just by weight loss or is there something else? And the answer is, we don't know, uh, but we need to figure it out. Um, Cause that could be also a very, very important um, point. And maybe patients who are not obese might benefit also if there's a separate um, effect of the G GLP-1 receptor on atrial fibrillation. Um, so again, we're in the infancy of the uh, testing and development of these therapies for atrial fibrillation. Uh, but I think these are going to be the kinds of treatments uh, that we need to focus on to improve the odds of having successful outcomes for ablation. Thank you, Dr. Goldberger. Important point. And then last but not least, piggybacking off of that, is the LEAF study currently enrolling patients or is you health a site? Because the people out there are saying, I'd like to be part of that study. Uh, thank you for that question. So uh, the LEAF study was um, was designed and developed uh, at UHealth uh, in conjunction with uh, my colleague, Gianluca Cabellas, who's a uh, world leading expert in the epicardial adipose tissue, which is the fat tissue that is around the heart. We, we believe that that fat tissue is really an important um, 
depot for all sorts of inflammatory and pro-fibrotic pro effects on the atrium, and that's what leads to atrial fibrillation. Um, this study, it was a single center study, all done here at UHealth. Thank God we've completed enrollment, we've completed follow-up. Uh, we're just really now in our data cleaning stage. Um, and then we'll have the publication that will hopefully be available for the public. Um, but once again, I, I will point out um, that the GLP-1 agonists are indicated uh, for obesity. It doesn't need to be used in the context of a study. Um, the, the one challenge that we have found in our risk factor modification program is that insurance companies are not so willing to pay for GLP-1 agonists. Um, and so often our patients get denied uh, for that. But again, it's, it's an improved medication in this context. It's not, it's not investigational. Okay, that that's good, and and like I, I think you did make some news tonight for the hundreds of people who are on this, uh, and listening intently for for new information, which leads me to the question, the burning question that so many patients have, and so many people in the chat box, do I have to be on Eliquis or these blood thinners, these anticoagulants forever, if I've had AFib, maybe it's resolved. They did my ablation. I understand that you have the, the guidelines saying if you hit more than these two risk factors, yes, you should be, but it's it's of concern to people. No, that's a great question. And um, the latest guidelines don't answer it directly. So the problem is, as Dr. Goldberg and I showed, the AFib ablation is not perfect. In addition, which neither one of us talked about, some people feel that even if you're normal rhythm, the fact that you've had AFib may still give you some residual risk for a stroke. So that said, um, we all use a little bit different strategy. If I have a patient whose risk score may be in the two, three or four range, but not like five, six, or seven, you know, kind of in the mild to moderate range. And we show that the ablation worked for that patient and they're not having it. Then we discuss the strategy of taking off the blood thinner. But I explained, I really want to know for sure. So sometimes we implant a little chip under the skin that monitors the patient 24 seven. Sometimes they'll, we'll go with a smart watch. It depends on the patient. The patient's really anxious about missing AFib. Sometimes we'll use both. You wear a smart watch, which might give you an alert and we use the chip. So it's really a shared decision-making discussion with your electrophysiologist. Yeah, I know there's no definitive answer, but it's, it's the burning question that so many of the patients ask. And this one as well, this three or four stages of AFib um, this patient had asked, I didn't even know that there was such a thing. At which point, at which stage should I consider ablation? Do you have to wait till stage four or is there such a thing? All right, I can take that. So um, I'm not exactly sure what the what the question is addressing, but there there is a um, a system scoring system out of Utah. Um, that was developed that classified into class one, two, three, and four. And it was based on the uh, degree of fibrosis uh, that there is in the atrium. That was specialized cardiac MRI that's, uh, that can actually detect how much fibrosis there is. And um, it turns out that the more fibrosis there is, the less likely ablation is to be successful. Um, so... It is an important component of the um, of the outcome, and it may be helpful to help us again individualize therapies because there may be therapies that might be more effective in patients who have advanced fibrosis that we are not using if we try to use a one size fits all to do ablation in everybody. So again, I would suggest, as as we have to everybody. Uh, every case of AFib is different, and we need to understand as much as we can about each person's atrium, about their comorbidities, about uh, the risk factors, and really try to come up with an individualized uh, treatment plan.
And Dr. Matrani, to you, um, there are ablations of 20 years ago and there are ablations of today and the most modern technology. And, and I saw in your presentation how you explained the different techniques and so forth. Could you tell us that, you know, you here at UHealth, we have the best ones or how, how would you rate that? We clearly have the best ones. So that's why I'm here. So we can do the most up-to-date and advanced research. The uh, hospital administration is very good about getting us the most advanced tools and keeping us in cutting edge. Not only that, we have clinical trials. So we have tomorrow's therapy here. So yes, we're using the pulse field. Uh, there's probably going to be generation two pulse field now coming up uh, at, at the beginning of 2025. So all these things have certain roles for certain patients. It's not one size fit all. There may be certain patients. We may still use cryo balloon and radio frequency given some certain individual patient factors where it makes most, most sense. So like Dr. Goldberger and I've been saying, it, it all comes down to an individual decision-making with the patient, see what's best for that individual and not try to shoehorn everyone into one type of therapy. Okay, here's an interesting question. Is there a genetic link to atrial fibrillation? If my husband had it, will my children possibly have it? So the studies show there is a genetic link but it's not like other genetic diseases where you inherit a mutation and it's done. It's more like a predisposition. All the environmental factors that Dr. Goldberger talked about, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, obesity, play a much larger role in that sense. Um, I wouldn't really worry about transmitting it. I think you and your kids need to live a healthy life, You know, do a lot of exercise, keep an ideal weight. The statistic I heard is the genetic component maybe accounts for 5% of the atrial fibrillation we see. But clearly we see someone, oh, my father had it, my brother has it, and now I have it. Okay, so there's some gene that gives you a predisposition. The but treatment's the same though. At this point, there's no genetic testing to determine. So the, the numbers being so low, it's not something that we really need to- There, there is a genetic test, but it's totally not useful or helpful because the treatment's the same. Um, here's something, because you, you brought up uh, the COVID infections, Dr. Goldberg, I think you said, um, you know, the question that people always ask about their concerns with the vaccinations. So is someone with AFib um, is not a good candidate to have COVID vaccine or should obviously be very careful not to have COVID infection? Can we talk about that? Sure. Um, so, the link between the vaccine and atrial fibrillation itself is very weak. Um, there's no question that uh, when you look at large populations of patients with COVID versus without COVID, uh, there's a higher incidence of atrial fibrillation. Uh, but the same is true with influenza. Uh, if you look at people with and without influenza, so, I mean, it, there's no question that in, an inflammatory condition um, can be a precipitant uh, for this. Now, we're not talking about um, something that you could detect in, you know, by studying five people. We're talking about looking at large populations of people to detect a small signal. Uh, so the signal is small and it, it again, it's not very useful uh, for uh, treatment and uh, of, an, of an individual patient knowing what their uh, inflammatory status is. All right. Again, I know we can't generalize this, but it's a question that people have, have submitted. How many episodes of uh, the AFib is sufficient to say ablation is now necessary? Is there such a thing? Is there such a number? Or is it a quality of life versus, I don't know. I, so uh, patients ask me that all the time. And and again, it just depends. Um, we I typically don't do it after one episode because I don't know when the next episode is going to be. And, and I have examples where one patient has an episode of AFib and their next episode is three, four, five years later. So if I did a sham ablation and I said at one year, you see the ablation worked, you didn't have it. So I, I, I typically try to see what the pattern is. However, I've had like an F-15 fighter pilot who had AFib. Mm 
Oh. After first episode, uh, he's getting an AFib ablation, right? You don't want someone playing an F15 with, with AFib or possibly with AFib. So it depends on the patient. It really depends how symptomatic they are. It depends on the frequency. Uh, certainly, if they're having it a few times a year, uh, they should consider it. However, I want to I want to do the counterpoint, which is uh, studies have now shown that early rhythm control, whether with medications or ablation, and we think ablation is generally better, leads to better outcomes in terms of not only not having AFib, but not having the serious deleterious consequences from the AFib. So we don't want to wait too long. We definitely don't want to wait too long. So we want to kind of get a pattern, but once you have a pattern, we want to get into the mix and trying to keep you in normal sinus rhythm. Yes, uh, in fact, th that is nipping it in the bud when it's early on. Exactly. All right, how about- I just, um, Can I oh, add something? I agree totally with uh, Dr. Mitrani, uh, but I think it's important to reiterate uh, for the vast majority of people with a first episode of atrial fibrillation, a wait and see attitude is better than jumping in with, with an ablation. That's for the vast majority of people. By the way, I am assuming that AFib presents itself um, in very different uh, symptomologies. Is that not uh, true that in some you feel the heart beating out of control and in others it could be a short of breath or so it's not very determinant sometimes? So yeah. everyone's different. Some patients have no symptoms. Some patients have intolerable symptoms where they can't do anything and and they're, they're, they can walk, they can exercise. And there are patients who don't have symptoms who say, I feel fine with my AFib. And for whatever reasons, we get them back into normal rhythm. We do an ablation or with medications. And then they come back months later and say, I feel great. It's like, I didn't know how badly I felt. So we as human beings sometimes accommodate to what's going on in our bodies. And we say, okay, this is our, our brain subconsciously says, this is a new normal, you feel fine, so I feel fine. And you do feel fine. But once you're back in rhythm, then you say, oh, I feel much better. And obviously an EKG is what's gonna show, like Dr. Goldberger showed the, with the rhythm being abnormal. That, that way you right. know you need it. Okay, here's a good question. Um, please describe again, we're gonna go back to the ablation. Everyone's focused on that because they think that's a cure, right? Um, describe the ablation procedure, how long it takes, is the patient awake? Are they under light sedation, under general? Please explain the process to them. So the patients are not awake when we do it. I don't know of any place where they're awake. Depending on the technique we use, it's either going to be general anesthesia or um, um, twilight anesthesia, like the type when you have an endoscopy or colonoscopy. The procedure if you count the anesthesia time, because they always take 30, 45 minutes just to get ready, can take two to three hours typically, sometimes less, sometimes more. We don't rush our procedures. I don't like to overschedule, and I know Dr. Goldberger is the same. We, we want to do this in a way that would help prevent the patients from having to come back for another ablation. That said, some patients do have to come back for a touch-up ablation. Patients typically go home the same day or the next morning. We, we don't kick patients out. just depends how they're doing a few hours later. It's good. People like to wrap their brain around detail like that, and, and that's important. So we're running out of time because I know that this is an incredible topic and we were going to. Um, but um, I think of maybe a final question, and then I'm going to ask you both to give us a, a summation, is um, can AFib be triggered by exercise during exercise? So in other words, we tell them be active, don't be a couch potato, but it, you know, but AFib can be triggered by exercise even after eating, things like that. So that, that's a very important question. So that goes back to uh, something I alluded to a little bit in uh, one of my slides is the autonomic nervous system. Um, that's the part of the nervous system that controls your heart rate when you exercise. Uh, it, it also is involved when you swallow and you eat, um, it gets activated. And there's an important relationship between the autonomic nervous system activity um, and atrial fibrillation. In fact, 
there are two kinds of autonomic nervous system activities that have been described to lead to atrial fibrillation. So one is like the exercise induced, and, and there are a lot of arrhythmias that are exercise induced. That's when you activate your sympathetic nervous system, the uh, fight or flight part of your nervous system. And there's something also called vagal atrial fibrillation. So that's atrial fibrillation that people get, for example, at night when the other part of the nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system is activated. So all these things can, can be implicated in atrial fibrillation. Um, what the optimal way to treat these um, is as yet not fully established. Um, but my one piece of advice is if you're faced with exercise-induced atrial fibrillation, the answer is, not to stop exercising. The answer is to get rid of the atrial fibrillation so that you can lead a healthy lifestyle and continue to exercise. That's right, that's right. So um, Dr. Mitrani, I'm gonna ask you to begin and then Dr. Goldberger can can sort of uh, sum us up because uh, this has been enlightening and um, life-changing, I think for many people listening to this uh, because they'll take action, they'll have an action plan. So Dr. Mitrani, where are we in the 21st century, 2024, when it comes to AFib? Uh, versus 30 years ago where people thought, I'm just going to live out of rhythm forever. Right. So uh, on the negative side, we have an epidemic of atrial fibrillation. We just see so much more of it uh, because of uh, people are living longer, which is a good thing. But unfortunately, people have more chronic diseases, whether it's obesity, hypertension, diabetes, heart failure, etc. But on the flip side, we have uh, improving therapies, with ablation, improving uh, medications, improving paradigms of treatment like Dr. Goldberger talked about. And AFib doesn't, it's not, it's not an arrhythmia that kills you like suddenly. It, and, but we have good strategies to prevent strokes, which is one of the most uh, devastating consequences from AFib. Yeah. And Dr. Goldberger, I'm gonna ask you to, to sum it in, in a way you had said, we're, we're getting still a C um, and, and D's and F's, uh, when are we going to kick it up to A's and B's in the treatment of, of atrial fibrillation in this country? So that, that's an excellent uh, question. And uh, I'll pull out my little crystal ball. Um, so I think we're starting to get there. And um, I think one of the more most important things in, in terms of what we're seeing, and, and I think we're definitely at the forefront here, is you know, that ablation is not the be all and end all to answer every problem for atrial fibrillation. It's a very good, uh, a very good treatment, but we need to start to think about other things. And I think in the past, what's happened is a lot of electrophysiologists have believed that if my ablation is not working, then I need to do more ablation and more ablation and more ablation. And the truth is that hasn't got us anywhere. So I think just coming up with this new approach that says, all right, we have ablation, it's very good, but now we're gonna throw in other things that will make it even better. I think that concept is really going to lead us into the future and provide really A's and B's, as you said, for our patients. Yeah, and as I said at the onset of the uh, webinar, that, that the fact that hundreds and hundreds of people are tuned in tonight, you know, on a Thursday night, um, for this webinar is is just how desperate, how frightened, how concerned they are that they have to address this. So uh, we cannot thank you enough uh, to top experts at the University of Miami Health System uh, dealing with atrial fibrillation and trying to make a difference. So thank you all for our experts. Thank you, our audience that has been very engaged. And I know all your answers were, uh, all your questions were not answered, but we are going to put up screens now so that you can contact the physicians and contact you health to move forward because not just every cardiologist is going to be able to address this it's a very subspecialty thank you doctors very much tonight and uh our program is at an end but please go to umiamihealth.org cardiovascular for more information consultations or screenings 305-243-5554 and give us uh, uh, some answers to our survey to suggest other topics Meantime, everyone, thank you for being with us tonight. Have a great night and please stay healthy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.